thank you all for coming to the talk. Um, and I'm just going to kind of launch in. Yeah, I hope. Wrong way. Do you hear me now, Noni? Can you hear me? Nice to meet you. Mola <laughs> gust. Welcome to Barcelona. Benvinguda a Barcelona. I don't know, Noni, if I could ask you to raise your arms. I would see what I els braços. Ja veieu que els aixeca. Uh, keep, them, keep them up, because now we'll show the robot. I ara anirem a veure el robot, que ja veieu. Can you move them a little bit more? A veure si els pot moure una mica més. Up and down. Doncs ja veieu que el robot reacciona perfectament amb la Noni. Noni, I'm ready to interview you now for, for a few minutes. Li farem una entrevista a la Noni per veure què li ha semblat aquesta experiència. You're a journalist, ella és una periodista, i fa una estona entrevistat un científic de Barcelona. You just interviewed a, a researcher from Barcelona, but in a, in a body of a robot. What was that experience like? So, for me, it starts to feel very natural after a while. Um, Occasionally, there's some problems with the, the, the eye movement in my head if I move too fast. But beyond that, very quickly, I'm in there in Barcelona with you. So, how did I end up being in two places at once? I don't know how many of you are familiar with a much older story about the rape in cyberspace. This was a situation which was a text space, basically virtual world. And somebody managed to hack into the virtual world um, and uh, rape a woman, like getting uh, other characters in the world through the text to rape her. And she was extremely upset. And it raised all these questions about, like, how could a text-based virtual world make you really feel like you've been raped? Um, and it just seems that, you know, we actually are um, very much... Um, have a, our digital sense of presence is really important to us. We have a super connection to it. And uh, researchers, Mel Slater and Maria Sanchez, call this response as if real. If you take a look at this uh, photograph here, this man is seeing himself from behind. He's got the video camera, uh, it's being, you know, broadcasting what he's seeing in those goggles. Well, they brought a hammer down in front of that video camera and he jumped. So even though he could see his own body ahead of him, he felt like he was where he was seeing himself from. And it just turns out that we're hardwired to adopt these virtual representations of ourselves as real. It's really the sense of embodiment that we get. So I've been using these ideas to create something I'm calling immersive journalism. And immersive journalism uses gaming platforms and virtual environments to convey news, documentary, and nonfiction stories. Essentially, we put the audience at a virtual reconstruction of the scene, but we use traditional journalism of gathering photographs, video, audio, all the sort of things that you would normally use in journalism. And then we take advantage of that sense of presence I'm describing, that sense of, of how you bring yourself into these virtual environments to make you feel like you're actually there, that you're, that you're around. Now, now, really for journalists, this is not really a new idea. Um, journalism has always tried to carry the reader like, or the viewer or as Brian did to the story, right? You to connect you there. Um, Maria Gellhorn, she was a World War II reporter, called it the view from the ground. And we had a famous American broadcaster called Walter Cronkite. Um, and in 1957, he created a series of films called You Are These There. Texians, as they are called, are Mexican citizens. Their province is part of the Mexican nation but their difficulties with the central government have steadily increased. Now there is open rebellion. March 5th, 1836. The siege of the Alamo. You are there. So, you know, I think they thought that voice could command you there. You wonder where that ubiquitous voice came from. So that was it. You are there. So, like, you know, that, that really the goal we've been trying to all achieve here. But um, interesting issues were raised in, in documentary games. I don't know how many of you are familiar with JFK Reloaded. Anybody? This was a game they put up on the web. There were so many conspiracy theories about how did JFK get you know, was killed, was it, what, could, could somebody have actually fired the shot from the book depository? So this game let you play the shooter. Hey man, could you make the shot? And they had it up on the web until somebody actually was able to shoot from that position and it was kind of the way that they dealt with this story, right? Uh, also during the uh, uh, Bush and John Kerry uh, campaign, there was a big controversy about whether he d deserved his medal he won in Vietnam as a swift boat operator. And this game let you just play carry and see if 
you could, you know, get the medal and whether you deserve the medal. Perhaps the most controversial of all was a 9-11 survivor. And in this, you just played a victim in the World Trade Center. One of the students who made this game uh, had been up gaming at night and he had his television on and it was like three in the morning for him. And he started seeing people jumping off of buildings. And for him, he was trying to come to terms with like, you know, what was going on and what happened. And, and he actually, they had to actually, the game designers, go in and take this existing game and strip out all the guns and the military and reshape it for their own purposes to tell for them was this important story. Um, the gaming company came after them and they lost in court $30,000. But in the meantime, the comments were, the game itself is not really a game at all. It keeps no, um, you know, uh, um, sorry, I need my glass on. It keeps no score, actual track of time. It's merely a moment caught in time. And I think in journalism, that's sort of the same thing that we're trying to do. You know, we're always trying to capture that moment in time. So, um, in my work personally, the f <laughs> one of the first pieces I built was a virtual Guantanamo Bay prison. Uh, started in Second Life and then uh, ended up at the Moss Museum of Modern Art. So I rebuilt it in Unity in 2013. But the but the deal with that was that I wanted to you know create a place that was accessible versus the real prison, which was inaccessible, albeit this was a virtual version. Um, we were very careful to draw on original source material. This is a photograph of how detainees were smuggled into Gitmo, and this was the way that um, people would come into our game. And I have to tell you that I did a documentary film first that had a huge segment on Guantanamo Bay, and then I used all that research to inform this build. As soon as I had put on my orange jumpsuit, I was thrown into the back of a C-17 transport plane and... You are immediately bound, and then a black hood comes over the vision of your avatar. Shut up! We then integrated some sounds that were based on descriptions of what real detainees heard. When the black hood is removed, you find that you're in a cage. Most of the footage is from original Defense Department shots of detainees in Guantanamo Bay. A replica of Camp Delta will be added to this camp X-ray soon. Noni wants it to include a habeas corpus game, enhancing the simulation of a place outside of the law. Like a regular video game where you get your choices. What do you do now? Call your parents? Call your lawyer? Ask what you're in here for? And the answers are, no, you can't call your parents. No, you can't call your lawyer. Sorry, not allowed to give you that information. No. So the next piece that I worked on was uh, utilizing a lot of Freedom of Information Act material on detainees being put in stress positions. You'd read these articles, stories. They're in a stress position for hours. Well, what did that really mean? And um, we decided to, working in a lab, I worked with a lab in Barcelona early on uh, in virtual reality, um, and we combined the logs of a particular detainee who the Bush administration had been, said had been tortured with an interrogation look logs, which we, we then set to um, audio. And again, I show videos because it's a lot easier to see. So um, those are the early version of virtual reality goggles long before the Oculus Rift hit the market. Um, and um, we wanted to see if we could actually put you in the body of a detainee. So once you see the virtual mirror and the, the, you can see it's moving, it's because the, the subjects were wearing a breathing strap. So they were breathing at the same time as this virtual avatar that they were seeing reflected in this mirror. You see you look down, you see your knees, and that's the muffled audio of the actual interrogation log coming through the other room, recorded with binaural audio, so it actually had that sensation of coming through the other room. Um, as you can see in this picture, uh, this is the way people were sitting, hands behind their back, but sitting upright in a chair. Amazingly, after a few minutes, everybody reported being hunched over in the stress position. And that gives you an idea of the power of um, how quickly you can take on the body of this virtual self that you're seeing. Um, and um, of course, there are really important questions. If I can give you that sort of a subjective experience, what sort of questions does that raise about journalistic integrity? And you know, what, what does it mean to have a subjective experience in VR? Um, this was a video that came out after we made our piece, which um, we didn't know anything about. Um, and I think that it legitimizes what we were doing. Wow. 
So in our piece, our, 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 the logs were sit down, stand. The sergeant told the victim to sit up and stand, or the, whatever, the, 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 the terrorist or the detainee to sit up and stand, you know, stand and sit down three times, and we would yell, you know, sit up, you know, stand up, sit down, stand up three times. So um, then the next piece I made was called Hunger in Los Angeles. And in this one, food banks were running out of food in America. And um, I wanted to try to do something that really captured what was going on. And uh, we started recording audio at food banks. On the left is the real line. At this point, doing journalism VR wasn't particularly um, well-funded. I think I spent about 700 bucks of my own money to make this piece. Um, and on the right are the virtual humans that we used um, to represent those real people in line. And, um, um, you know, when the guy who's standing in a long line doesn't get any food and he's got diabetes, he, he's going to collapse. He, he collapsed into a, ver uh, a coma. And that's somebody wearing our goggles on the right. Again, I'll show you a little There's film. Too There's too many okay. people. There's just too many people for this woman. All real audio. Oh, somebody Okay, he's having a seizure. Okay. So this man has a seizure and goes into a coma while we're recording. We then had to rebuild all that in the virtual reality space, including motion capturing all the action. Now this person has the goggles on, and for them, that's all happening life-size in real time. He's going to be very careful not to walk around the, or step yeah, over yeah, onto yeah, the body. Please, please. 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 Result in it was sort of what a big scare. Oh, you're crying! You're crying, Gina. You're crying. So I was really surprised at the reaction. Clearly, you can hear that in my voice. But also, if you see the goggles that she had on, some of you here might be familiar with the Oculus Rift. Um, those goggles were built by Palmer Lucky before he went and started off the company. So Palmer was uh, like our lab assistant and actually uh, bump, built my goggles and crashed in my hotel room at Sundance. So we were all launching this stuff together. Um, the next piece that I built uh, was uh, funded by AP, Google, and Tribeca, and um, it's about a, a guy who was living in the U.S. for 27 years, and then he was um, uh, caught after having doing, you know, had no work and had never been in trouble before. He stole a bottle of tequila and a steak for his wife on Mother's Day. When he tried to sneak back into the country, he was caught by Border Patrol, and um, they beat him really viciously. And, and taste him. This is video that was captured off a cell phone. Um, and we, um, and ultimately he was killed by Border Patrol. And um, we rebuilt the scene um, in the VR space. Um, and um, it was, there were two sets of videos, one down at the ground where you have that audio and then there was one up from a bridge by this young woman, and she was the one who was able to capture the fact that there were some, you know, 15 uh, officers involved in the event. So I brought her down to my lab, and we scanned her. We facial scanned her, and we body scanned her, and I facial captured, and I motion captured her, so that when she, uh, you see her virtual self in the piece, Every action that she's making, every movement, everything she's saying was actually recorded by her. So her own memories, rather than sitting her down and having her say to me, this happened and that happened, or me try to recreate it, she recreates it herself through her physical actions and through her words. And again, we tried to stay very true to the virtual environment, uh, the real environment that we brought into the virtual environment. And that premiered this last spring in Tribeca. Um, I was in commission to build a piece for the World Economic Forum about Syria, uh, which premiered at Davos, and um, again, yes, trying to film helps. So we were trying to, we now put you on the ground on a street in Aleppo when a bomb goes off. And then what I did is I sent a, t and that, that material we had to source from a video camera and from multiple, multiple 
um, cell phone videos that were taken of the time and photographs of what the street looked like beforehand so that I could integrate the two things. I just want to shout out to Mikkel Rasmussen, who was my lead programmer in the audience, who's Danish, who lives in Copenhagen, on that piece. Um, and then I also sent a team to a refugee camp to record children. And we used imagery of children to try to kind of one for one represent them in the virtual world. Uh, at Davos, we had everybody from Peter Gabriel to John McCain go through. Um, and then a, an amazing contingent of Syrian um, folks who, who really um, appreciated, I think, the piece as, as being able to tell their story. Um, interestingly, beyond that kind of uh, higher level or, or decision-making kind of audience, it also went to um, uh, the Victorian Albert Museum this June, and um, I was told that their guest book... Um, it was the most time anybody ever spent in the guest book, and we have 54 pages of comments from people just talking about how powerful the experience was for them. Uh, wrapping up, just want to say that it's not... Um, I was commissioned to do a Formula One piece, so it doesn't all have to be human rights, although the Formula One piece kind of feeds my... helps support my human rights habit, as it were. Uh, and... Um, uh, just to say, though, that I am taking still documentary footage. The Formula One guys, at some point, they basically unionize to make their cars be safer. And um, the drivers really look out for each other. And the, uh, we have a crash, but that um, we want to show the camaraderie. So this is a piece we've just mo-capped, and we're going to be putting that in the virtual space as well. I uh, want to finally finish up with um, the idea that um, even though I work in these very um, difficult technologies in terms of motion capture and all this equipment we build and, and using motion tracking cameras to make you feel like you're actually there. Uh, this thing is moving very fast. You're going to be able to make 3D models yourself really quickly. Also, there's the three tiers. There's my fully tracked system where you have to be there and walk around an installation. Then there's the Oculus Rift VR goggles, which are going into everybody's living room. And then finally, there's these mobile viewers. We, we made up these fold-up viewers Quite a few years ago, I brought them up to Google. This is a funny photograph I found. And of course, now Google's released their Google their own cardboard version most recently. So in conclusion, I just want to say that uh, uh, you really can immerse yourselves in news stories uh, that I say, you know, immersive journalism through this embodied feel. Uh, gaming platforms and cutting edge technologies can really reflect and engage with our reality. And um, that this is a kind of a rhetoric, a, a very new type of persuasive speaking, because I can tell you, I collected data amongst um, a lot of my participants, and these experiences feel like reality to them. So um, welcome to the new world of embodied digital rhetoric. Thank you.